Amen. Wonderful truth and wonderful singing. We appreciate that so much. Please take your Bible and turn to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 2. I want to pick up on a Bible study that we started last week. 2 Timothy, chapter 2. Is where we will kick off the Bible study. I started this last week, and the, the title is Basics of Bible Study, Basics of Bible Study, and I said that we were going to center our thoughts around five words, and because of the introduction and so forth, I only got through one word, and so there are four words left. I don't know that I'll get through all four words, but <laughs> if not, we will uh, finish it. Lord willing, next week, unless we get done. So this is basics of Bible study, and it's centering around five words. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and in verse 15, was the verse that we launched from. 2 Timothy 2, 15. The Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, that we have a copy of the inspired, preserved word of God. Amen. Dear Lord, we are thankful that there are still people who have a desire to know you, and that will be through the word of God. Pray, dear Lord, tonight that you would forgive me of my sins, fill me with your spirit. Please allow me to be able to preach and teach word of God with truth without heresy and as your word goes forth that it would land on fertile ground and produce fruit in the heart and life of the one that speaks and those that listen. Help us to be people of the book of the Bible, your word. Praying that you will give glory and honor to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 2 Timothy 2.15 the Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. And so we use that verse as a launch verse for the lesson called Basics of Bible Study. And the first word that uh, we brought out was inspiration. And that, of course, is 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 16. The Bible says that uh, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. And so in uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, the, uh, well, if you look at this verse, I think I misquoted or transposed uh, two words. In 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction in righteousness. And so uh, that first word that we used was inspiration. And we spent the rest of our time last week on the fact that uh, the Bible is the inspired word of God. It, it's God's book. It, it's his Bible. And uh, the word inspiration, we said, was found in Job chapter 32, verse 8 as well. And the reason that we emphasize that so much on a familiar portion of scripture is that in the basics of Bible study when you open up the word of God you have to open it up saying within your heart this is God's word it's not uh, man's book it's God's book it's God's word it's the inspired word of God so we talked about that some people approach the Bible as if they're going to attempt to find error in it. And uh, the Bible believer approaches the Bible as it is God's word looking for truth and help, not trying to prove something wrong because you can't. It's God's Bible. We said that whenever that an individual approaches the Bible as if there is error and falsehood in it, that's acting like one of the Pharisees when they were trying to 
catch Jesus in his words. And so you and I uh, open up the word of God, realizing, believing that this is the inspired word of God. It's God's book. So the Holy Spirit of God moved holy men of God as they spake and uh, they penned the words that you and have. That's inspiration. Inspiration is talked about, spoken of, it'll say in the originals or the autographs. That means when uh, God the Holy Spirit spoke to the penmen, about 40 penmen penned the books of the Bible, 1600 years time frame, a variety of backgrounds with one theme, Jesus, throughout it all. And uh, so the Holy Spirit of God moved men to pen what God wanted them to write. And that's inspiration. That's spirit in. It's a spirit book. It's inspiration. That was word number one. Now, word number two is preservation. Preservation. In inspiration, God has demonstrated the ability through the Holy Spirit of God to pen us a book. In black and white, we have a copy of God's Word. He used human penmen, but He moved them to write what He wanted them to write. And it's, it's all about God. It's all about Jesus. Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they that testify of me. And so the whole Bible is a testimony of the Lord Jesus. I'm looking for Jesus in, uh, in the passages. I'm looking for Jesus. And uh, that's the inspiration. God was able to give us that book. Preservation is just as important. There are a lot of individuals that believed that God inspired a Bible or inspired the Bible and gave the Bible. However, they depart on this like important doctrine called preservation. That means that God has the ability to keep His book. God gave you the book. Amen. Then God has the ability to keep that book. God would not inspire a Bible and then lose it. God, who inspired the Bible, used human penmen to write the book. God, in preservation used men to still write and preserve the book. There's no difference. They go hand in hand. So the doctrine of preservation is just as important and just like inspiration. However, you're, you're going to hear all kinds of arguments <laughs> against that. But if we just allow the Bible to speak for itself and so you know these passages, but I want you to get them back in here and in here. And, and this is a, a basic approach of Bible study. I have to open up the book and say, this is God's Word. This is inspired. Not only by inspiration, but it's kept by preservation. And so Psalm 12, 6 and 7. Now, most all of you have these. If you don't, then you get a hold of them and you either mark them or at least know the address where to go to get them because you need it. And there's so many arguments in opposition to this. In Psalm chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, and, and when we open these up, you remember in, in, in teaching, I talked about this. You, you kind of teach from an overall global picture, and you keep it, and then you zero down as well. And so I keep in mind that verse, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture means all the Old Testament 
all the New Testament. The things that were written aforetime were written for what? Our learning and admonition. Romans chapter 15. And so in Psalm, 12, in Psalm chapter 12, verse 6, the Bible says, The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. And that's talking about perfection. Seven times perfection. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So that is the basic verse of the launch pad of the word preservation. So inspiration, 2 Timothy 3.16. Typically, you won't get an argument that God inspired a Bible. From this point on, you will. And uh, you have to determine where you stand on, on the matter. God gave us a book, then God is able to preserve and keep the book. Preservation. That's God's ability to keep His book. So, uh, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Who is He saying? <coughs> will preserve them. God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So God gave them, breathed, inspiration, and God is keeping them or preserving them. And so then you go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. And in verse 89. Psalm 119, verse 89. The Bible says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Now, when you looked at Psalm 12, 6, and 7, and I'm not going to pick this apart too much. This is basics of Bible study. He said, the words of the Lord. The words of the Lord. All the words. It's not thoughts. It's the words. All the words. Plural. And then, from a when I, when I talk about a, a global standpoint of teaching, then the psalmist is saying, Forever, O Lord, thy word. That's holistically. The word, the whole word, the whole compilation of the word is settled in heaven forever. Thy word, the word of God. And it's already the words. All right? So you got the words. And then, of course, you go New Testament in Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24. The second word is preservation. So I'm approaching the Word of God, that it is given by inspiration, it is God's Word, and then I'm approaching the Word of God that it is preserved, and God has done both of those for me and you. Matthew chapter 24, and in verse uh, 35, The Bible says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Now, uh, we haven't gotten into the, the next word yet, but looking at that, heaven and earth shall pass away. When will heaven and earth pass away in the basic interpretation of that verse? Well, it, it's not just some kind of a simile here, it is going to be renovated by what? <clears throat> Not a flood, but by what? Fire. A fire. And so it is going to be renovated by fire. Remember that verse that said the same word that's keeping this thing in store is going to be kept until it's renovated by fire. It will pass away with a great noise and fervent heat. How does that take place? It, it doesn't have to take place because of an atomic fallout of a nation. All God has to do is just let go of the atoms. And there, there's enough power there if you let go that it will burn up. And so it'll be renovated.
but the word of God will not pass away. It's forever settled. So this earth, young people, is reserved unto fire. You don't get so, deeded, so deeply rooted in this earth, in the earthly, because it's going to be renovated by fire and all burned up. Anyway, uh, Matthew 4, if you go backwards, and verse 4, Matthew 4, 4. This is the Lord Jesus Christ who was being tempted by the devil. Now, this is used in this word of preservation, but it will also be used later in our last word, which is application. But I'm not having you jump your mind all the way to the last word, but that is in, in that as the song was sung tonight and touches hearts, godly songs touch the heart. Ungodly songs, uh, they touch the flesh. So you have to be careful with that. The, the Word of God is your sword, and it's being used as a sword, as an example to you and I, through the Lord Jesus Christ, being tempted by the devil. Now, he is he's without sin, Jesus is. He was not going to be able to be stopped. He's God in the flesh, but he is giving you and I an example. How will you get the victory over the devil, young person? How will you get the victory in the day of battle? Well, it's Matthew 4, 4. But he answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. So if it's written, he's digging into the Old Testament to bring this out to you. Most of the times that Jesus quoted scripture was like from the book of Deuteronomy. But anyway, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so this begs the question, if Jesus is fighting the devil as an example for you and I, and telling you and I that we shall not live just by physical food alone, by bread, you shall not live by bread alone or physical food, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, then it would stand to reason that we have to have every word that has proceeded out of the mouth of God. That is divine preservation. Not one word lost. And so you, you have to accept that, interpret that in that fashion or not. Now in Isaiah and in chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. And so the words of the Lord are pure words, purified seven times, Psalm 12, 6, and 7, and uh, Isaiah chapter 40. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away, preservation. And then a commandment that you and I shall not live by bread alone or physical food alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And so there is... Uh, the, the very divine logic that God has given us in every word Bible. Isaiah chapter 40 and in verse 8 again preservation the grass withereth the flower fadeth but the word of our God shall stand forever. Alright so this is the doctrine of preservation. It is just as important as the doctrine of inspiration. You have a Bible. God gave you a Bible, and He's able to preserve that uh, Bible. God has not lost His Word. God has preserved His Word. And so, uh, God is able to save your soul. The same God who is able to save your soul is the same God who is able to keep your soul saved. You can't help God saved you. You can't help keep yourself saved. God saves you. God keeps you saved. God gave you a Bible. God keeps his Bible. God has kept his word. He keeps it. All right. It is said that God is the one that keeps his word. If you approach the Bible that is given by inspiration, then you must also approach the Bible that is kept by preservation. 
personally, personally, it's either a huge turnoff and I spit that bone out or I don't even listen when somebody says a better translation would be. Now, you, you take it for whatever that you want, but uh, if God has a Bible that he gave by inspiration, and God has kept his Bible by preservation, then there can't be a better translation. So which one is it? It's the King James Bible. Amen. And so uh, the individual, and, and I'm not knocking anybody with what I'm about to say. This is uh, more of a personal basis. Well-known preachers, I understand that. Radio preachers, TV preachers, and well-known preachers would say something to the effect, a better translation would be. And uh, I, to me, they're putting themselves smarter than God. God inspired it, and God preserved it. And you and I have to trust that we have a preserved Word of God, or you don't. And that's the bottom line. It's not preserved in a hundred different versions, nor do you have to seek the latest version to try to determine what God said. And I am not impressed, and nor do I try to get involved in Greek to try to determine from the original Greek manuscripts what it said. You would not be able to do that. Somebody's trying to tell you how smart they are. What they need to do is see what it says in English and read it and believe that God has given you an English Bible. God has preserved it in the King James Bible. And so you and I need to, to read it and uh, study it, understand it, and so forth. That's the doctrine of preservation. Now let me summarize that unless I have already turned you off. I would say everybody here would believe that God gave a Bible by inspiration. You wouldn't doubt that. Where it becomes a demarcation point is this thought, is it really preserved for the English-speaking people in the King James Bible? And then, if not, the question begs itself, where is it? Because if you say, well, it's preserved in the original languages uh, somewhere, you don't have the autographs, the original notes the men took, you don't have that. And uh, the Greek manuscripts are all over the place. So whether you think that you're going to train yourself in reading Greek to read the original New Testament, uh, you're not going to have that either. God inspired it. God gave it to you in the English, in the King James Bible. If it's all different in all these other Bibles, then it can't be the words of the Lord or pure words. And so uh, from this pulpit, the stance is God gave the Bible by inspiration and God kept the Bible by preservation and it's in your King James Bible. English speaking. All right, here's word number three. This is the basics of Bible study. You're approaching the Word of God that it is inspired, <coughs> given by God. You're approaching the Word of God that it is preserved. And so I have to say this before I go on. And this, will, this may get too deep for you. Is that you approach the Word of God that it was given by inspiration and... Uh, God said it, men pinned it, there they had it. It's kept by preservation where uh, he used men to pin this into uh, the English translation for you and I. That's preservation. When you open up the Word of God, if you open it up from that standpoint, then you have every word that God gave. You have the same word. Now that's deep for you. But it means that the Bible they had, you have. You have it in English. The words of the Lord are pure words. Purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them forever from the 
this day forward. So you you have the Bible. You don't have to say, well, if I would have had what they had, you do have it. You don't have to say, well, if God would have pinned that down, you know, if I would have seen that and everything, no, you have it. You've got it in black and white. You have the Word of God. All right, here's word number three. I said word number one was inspiration. This is basics of Bible study. Word number two is preservation. They go together. Inspiration, preservation. Word number three is interpretation. Interpretation. Now, I, I've used this word before. It's a big word. It's not for uh, impressing nobody. I can't do that. But it's if you get into Bible studies and you start seeing this, it's just what it means. There's a word called hermeneutics. And hermeneutics is the art and science of biblical interpretation. It just is a fanciful word. It means about proper Bible study. And proper Bible study launches off with this. You compare Scripture with Scripture. You're comparing Scripture with Scripture. Because if you don't, and you pull a Scripture out, that's why you have all kinds of different churches. You have to compare Scripture with Scripture. All right? Now, uh, I, I believe that we touched on this last week, but I want to give these to you uh, once more. So this third word is interpretation. What is God saying to me? Or saying? What is God saying? In 1 Peter chapter 3, and in verse 15, In interpretation, this is your primary verse that you use. And uh, Bible scholars that use the word hermeneutics, this is their verse that they use. I'm not downgrading that word. It's, it's a real word, but it means how to study the Bible. Right interpretation is uh, 1 Timothy 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Now, I'm not going to go off on too much of a tangent on this, but I use the word sanctify quite often. And when you got saved, you were positionally sanctified. If any man be in Christ, he is a what? new creature. All th old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If any man be in Christ, that's called a position. That is positional sanctification. And that means that when you got saved, you were as a fire brand plucked out of the fire. And a young person does not understand that or get that. I hope that they would. The older that we get, we realize that, uh, as David said, I, I'm just a step between death. You don't know what a day may bring forth. And you can't get saved later. You're, you're like on a thread hanging over hell. And if you don't get saved, you die and go to hell. And a firebrand plucked out of the fire is the moment that you got saved. Praise God for that. And that is positional sanctification. It means set apart for God. Practical sanctification is when you set yourself apart for God. I'm set apart for God when He saved me. I'm in Christ. Praise God. The devil can't get me. I'm a firebrand plucked out of the fire. But are you setting yourself apart for God? That's practical sanctification and it's also a word we use called separation. I'm separated unto God. Well, right here he says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. I already know I'm set apart for Him. I'm saved. Amen. But are you setting yourself apart for Him? If you don't set yourself apart for Him, uh, He's not going to show you anything. Why would He show you the precious jewels of the Bible and you're not setting yourself apart for Him? And so you sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer. 
this is a primary verse about right interpretation. And so 1 Peter 3.15 deals with right interpretation, that I can give an answer to every man of the hope that lies within me. And this will become more clear. Uh, and then I'm going to give you one more verse and then a statement. In 2 Timothy 3.15, I'm talking about the third word is interpretation. 2 Timothy 3.15. You can take uh, any passage that you want out of context and make a doctrine out of it. And so we'll give an example of that before we close off. We only have about six minutes left. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.15. The Bible says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith in uh, Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy uh, 3.15 That thou hast known the Holy Scriptures that is able uh, to make you wise unto salvation. <coughs> there is right interpretation and then uh, there is also uh, a right division. 2 Timothy 3.16 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And... Uh, talking about uh, rightly dividing the word of truth and so forth. Now here's two big words for you. In interpretation, so you have right interpretation and you have a right division, rightly dividing uh, the word of truth. There is a term called uh, exegesis. Now, again, no big deal. But what that means is extracting from the truth of the text what it means. You've heard somebody say in passing, an exegete. It simply means to pull out of the scriptures what's there. Because if not, the reverse of that is called eisegesis. And that means reading into the scripture what it does not say. So our desire in interpretation and we're studying the word of God it's given my inspiration, it's kept my preservation, and then I have interpretation. I'm wanting to read through the scriptures, what does it say? I don't want to read into the scriptures what it does not say. I'm going to give you an example. I go to Mark 16, 16. Go to Mark 16, 16. And I, I'm not going to be mean by any of this, but I just want to, I want to show you something of where you have to compare Scripture with Scripture. In Mark 16, verse 16, the Bible says, Jesus says, in the gospel message of going forth, great commission, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, he that believeth and is <coughs> baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, without being mean, uh, this is uh, the life verse of the church of Christ. And so, you're going to have to say that if you follow that line of exegesis or interpretation of scripture that you would say you have to believe and be baptized before that you can be saved. And so if that is the verse that you use, then you are led to this that you have to believe 
and you have to be baptized before you can be saved. So do you get it? That's what I'm saying. So that's that big fanciful word. Am I extracting from it? Am I reading into it? And, and so forth. And so, um, give you another one here. We're almost out of time. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. This is just an example of the third word that I use, interpretation. And you could say, I really don't, I'm not benefiting from this Bible study or not. I think you are. And it may get deep, but you can understand where when you put these things together and you approach your Bible, that you have to be careful even in the area of rightly dividing the word of truth and interpretation. In Matt, I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, the Bible says, This is the day of Pentecost, Peter preaching. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? That's called conviction. That's what the Holy Spirit of God does when the Word of God is preached. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So you read that and you say, Repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. And so there is a, a complete doctrine and a church that are based on that. So you, I'm not going to leave you hanging. We're almost out of time. But I'm going to show you where you understand that you have to compare Scripture with Scripture to either accept that or uh, try to determine uh, what is being said. Acts chapter 8, verse 36, of course. Acts chapter 8, verse 36. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, and uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Now, if it was water baptism, then there would be no hindrance. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he went on with the baptism. Now, that may not be enough for you, so let me give you a couple more. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In verse 17. The Bible says, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 1, 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of none effect. He sent me not to baptize. It's baptismal waters brought about regeneration. All right? 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. In 1 Peter chapter 3. And in verse 21, the Bible says, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Parenthetical thought, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is not that baptism washes away sin. It is of a good conscience or first step of obedience. <coughs> All right? Here's the last one we'll do for right now. In Ephesians chapter 1. Galatians, Ephesians. This third word is interpretation. In Ephesians chapter 1. Here is biblical salvation. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12, that we should be the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, 
which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Salvation by grace through faith in the blood and not the baptismal pool. That's just one example of proper interpretation. And there's others. And so basic uh, Bible approach, basic Bible studies, given by inspiration, kept by preservation, and then the interpretation of the scriptures, uh, comparing scripture with scripture. Let's bow for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible study that you allowed us to enter into. Help us to be Bible students. And dear God, workmen that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Help every one of us, dear Lord, to stay true to the word and true to you. Praying, dear God, if there is one here or next door that's never accepted Christ as personal Lord and Savior, that they get it settled. And then after that, we would want to follow you. Yes, in believers' baptism, and dear Lord, in church membership, and a Bible student, looking for the blessed hope and soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.